I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Now, starting in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, and I'll be out of the NASB version today. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Isn't that really true of all of us? Aren't there things that you and I are doing that we absolutely hate? Aren't there things that we end up saying and doing that we wish we could stop? I believe everybody in the room this morning or within the sound of my voice could say that very same thing. Well, I think you'll find hope in this morning's sermon. There is something we can do about it. We don't just have to be a victim of things happening in our lives and us being led around. We can change much of what's in our life, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we're going to find out ways we can conquer the things in our lives that we're doing that we absolutely hate. Verse 16, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now let's stop right there. Verse 16 is very sobering, isn't it? When we sin, we know that it is wrong. And by our knowing and even admitting that what we have done or are currently doing is wrong, we're in effect agreeing with God's word. We agree with the law that God's word is right and we are wrong. Don't you sense that conviction that you just know what you're doing? It's not right. And you know God's word is right. When you read the scriptures, you know it's right. It's true. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Now, if that sounds very familiar to you, it should, because the epistle of Romans, the book of Romans, is written by the apostle Paul. But that sounds very familiar, and actually, it was what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Jesus said these same things. Keep watching and praying that you may not, or not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So really the apostle Paul was teaching the very same thing that Jesus had been teaching in the gospels. If you're like me, we really want to do right, but something happens. Now, verse 19. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. I want you to see a key word in that verse. The key word is practice. What are you practicing? What evil or what sin are you practicing? Did you know that you can practice living righteously or you can practice living sinfully? And do you remember the old cliche? Practice makes perfect. And that works both ways. We can really practice our sin. I know some people that have gotten really good at their sin. And I used to be one of them. But I also know some people have gotten very good at practicing their righteousness in Christ. And they've gotten very good at it. They really live for Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can see that in their lives. So you can practice sin or you can practice righteousness. Now what happens if you practice sin? You get better at living out your sin. What happens if you practice living out your righteousness in Jesus? Then you get better at living the Christian life. Verse 20. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. The Apostle Paul gives us a solid principle to keep in the back of our minds every single day the principle is know that evil is present in you and even though you really want to do good that evil that's present in you you and I must stay focused on Jesus Christ and God's word 
to not live out that evil, that sin that dwells in us all. And if we keep this principle in the back of our minds every day, it could make a huge difference moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Amen? Okay, so there's two words I really want you to zone in on here. Practice and principle. You need to remember the principle that evil is present in you. There is no person since Adam and Eve that's not a sinner. So you have sin present in you. You have evil present in you. The Bible also calls it iniquity, transgression, and wickedness. You have that in you, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how good I think I am. And me being a pastor does not take away from that a bit. I'm still a sinner. I still do evil. I still do wickedness. You go, oh, well, then I'm changing churches. <laughs> the pastor that will not admit that he is a sinner and that he does evil and does wickedness and commits transgressions and iniquity doesn't need to be preaching. Because he needs to be humble enough to say, I'm a sinner and I still need the blood of Jesus every day in my life. So when I look at you, I know how hard it is to walk your talk. I need to remember daily, and so do you, that the principle of evil and sin and wickedness live inside of us. Paul taught us that. The principle lives in us. And then what do you practice? Keep the principle in the practice. The principle is evil and sin is in me. The practice is I'm going to practice righteousness. I'm not going to practice my sin. You get a chance to practice whatever it is you want to practice, right? So we want to go practice football. We want to go practice lifting weights. We want to practice basketball. We want to practice soccer. We want to practice volleyball. We want to practice all of these things that we love. Did you know that if you continue to practice sin, it's because you love sin? Otherwise, why would you keep practicing it? There is a love-hate relationship with sin. Because sinners aren't sinners just because we sin. We sin because we're already sinners. It's part of us. Verse 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wow. Did you realize this morning that there is a war raging inside of you and inside of me? The inner man, our Christian spirit, and our flesh, our sin nature, are constantly at war with each other. Watch what the Apostle Paul says about this war that he fights each and every day. Now, remember, this is the Apostle Paul. This guy wrote most of our New Testament, and we consider the Apostle Paul to be a very godly, a very righteous, a very holy man. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Exclamation. Paul absolutely hated, he absolutely hated the war that he sensed raging inside of him. Don't you hate it? Don't you just wish there was that way to just take out that sin nature and just live a godly life every day? Don't you wish you'd just get rid of that? You know how you get rid of it? You die. But you're not supposed to hurry that along. We are not to commit suicide. <laughs> Some people do. They get tired of the war. But Jesus said we are to fight the good fight of faith until we die because of his timing. Or Jesus returns. You don't take your own life. You fight that good fight until it's over on God's timetable. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? I've read that before and I'm like, Paul? Wretched man? Oh, I'd give anything to be like the Apostle Paul. If there were three people that I could sit down with in time, it would be Jesus, it would be Moses, and it would be Paul. Wretched man that I am, I mean, what's he saying? He's being honest is what he's saying. He's got that war raging inside of him, that trying to live holy in Jesus, and also that living out the evil and sin every day. Paul is so tired of the spiritual battle. He's so tired of the war that is raging inside of him. Watch closely, though, because he goes from this wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? He asks the question, and then praise God, he gives you the answer. He doesn't just leave you for all generation to wonder, what's the answer to the question? I used to hate that in class. I'd go, and my math teacher would put a question up there, or a science teacher, or a history teacher, put a question up there and just look at you blankly. I don't know the answer. It's why I'm taking the course. 
right? If you're going to ask me a question, help me along with the answer. Well, he does that. In verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Verse 25, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord! Exclamation point. Did he put anything else in there to help him answer the question of how to deal with the raging war inside of him? No. Jesus is it! Not self-help books, not a pill, not a bottle, not your best friend, not a co-worker that seems to have it together. And by the way, most of the people that work with you that give you information and counsel and advice at your office, their life is more screwed up than yours. That's true. Paul listed nothing else as far as to how to win that war on a day-to-day basis except thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me ask you this. These sins that you're really struggling with, if you've got sins in your life you're really struggling with, is Jesus your answer? Is that where you run? When you've got these recurring sins that you and I keep practicing, are you running to Jesus to go, Lord, help me? Do you run to prayer? Do you run to your Christian brothers and sisters for accountability? Do you run to the scriptures for hope and encouragement and wisdom? Remember the little fortune cookie I put up there earlier? The little piece of paper that fell out of my fortune cookie? said, enjoy life! It's better to be happy than to be wise. And then gives you the lucky lotto numbers. That was a terrible waste of a tree to plant all that on. If you want to enjoy life, it is better to be wise than happy. Forget the lotto. Give unto your Lord in tithes and contributions. Verse 25 is awesome. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's another part of verse 25. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Did you know that when you're following along with a car and you see all the Christian things on the bumper stickers and you see the ichthus and you see the cross and you see something about Jesus, those people really do want that on there or they wouldn't have bought it and put it on their car. But also they were speeding 10 miles over the limit and they were giving the guy beside them the finger. (laughs) Do you see the war raging? They really did put that car on their their, their sticker and things on their car because they believe. And they wanted that to be what was a witness to you and the car following them. But that war that's raging inside of them is gaining mastery of them at that moment. They were giving in to the war of sin and doing some very ungodly things. So what's going on here? Well, the Apostle Paul is showing people that a Christian has two different natures. They have a sin nature and they have a righteous nature. And these two natures are always in conflict with one another. They never bed down together. They are constant enemies. Your sin nature and your Christian nature are always in conflict. I don't know about you, but I hate to see Paul, a good, strong, holy, godly Christian man, struggle with sin in his life. But, selfishly, it sure does make me feel better to know that this man of God, this apostle, was not perfect either. That he had major sin struggles in his life just like you and just like me. And that the sin he committed regularly bothered him just like my sin and your sin bothers us. But let me ask you a question. Does your sin really bother you? Think about that for a minute. Does your sin bother you? If it does, that's great news. That means you're being convicted. And it's by the Holy Spirit to stop. And to ask forgiveness and to be cleansed and to continue to live for Jesus the way you should. But if your sin doesn't bother you, then that's not good news at all. In fact, you have a serious problem. Paul knew that the holiness and righteousness and perfection of Jesus Christ was his goal. He had seen the risen king on the road to Damascus. Paul didn't look at other people's sins when he judged himself. Paul judged himself, not against other people sitting next to him, 
Paul judged himself against the holy, righteous, perfect Savior Jesus Christ. Listen to this verse written by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. He's the worst. The Apostle Paul is the worst sinner on the planet? No, no, Paul, see, I am. Right? We should all be fighting the Apostle here to say, oh, no, 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 me. You're like, oh, no, no, me. Oh, no, no, me. But is that really our attitude a lot? Don't we look at the fellow down the street and go, oh, boy, I'm sure glad I'm not like Tim. Boy, I'm sure glad I don't live like Bob. Boy, I'm sure glad I don't live like Terry. And if you're late, I'm sure glad I don't live like Susie. I'm sure glad I don't live like Betty. I'm sure glad I don't. Boy, I got my life. Kept. Boy, they need Jesus. Right? That is looking at other people and you thinking that you have somehow attained a higher level of righteousness than them. Paul didn't look at life that way. Here is a trustworthy statement saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Wow, Paul did not do what a lot of us do. He didn't point to the guy next to him. He pointed to himself and said, I am such a sinner. If you really were to gauge your holiness and righteousness and perfection against Jesus Christ, what would you say? If you really were to look at how awesome and holy Jesus is, and then look at your own life, how does that compare? You would absolutely say, I am the worst sinner of us all. And it wasn't false humility that Paul was experiencing. He truly felt horrible for his daily sin against his Savior and Lord. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Paul had true humility before God and before men. Do you? Do I? Pride keeps us from dealing with our sin. But humility helps us face our sins so that we can stop them, confess them, repent of them, give them to Christ and ask Him to help us to live righteously. Are you prideful today or are you humble today? On the screen, you're going to see a slide that has many different sins, but there are different types. On the left-hand side, you'll see a column that says sins of commission. Well, what is sins of commissions? Commission means commit, sins that we commit. And then on the right, there is a list of sins of omission. What does omission mean? Things that you omit, things that you're supposed to be doing but not doing. Okay, could we put all of the sins up on the screens? Absolutely not. Read your Bible. There's way more sins than we can actually put on a slide. So I just grabbed a few, put them on the left, ones that we commit. Just grabbed a few, put them on the right, sins that we omit. Let's just walk through these just to even hear them. And you know what's going to happen? As we walk down through this list, you're automatically going to judge, I don't do that, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. Oh, I do that a little, I don't do this. It may not even be your sin that's listed, but I'll bet you the Holy Spirit points out immediately where you are. What's going on in your life? Because you and the Lord know what's going on. Lust, greed, angry words being spoken, jealousy, envy, impatience, judging, unforgiveness, sexual immorality, gluttony, drunkenness, cursing, stealing, lying. Can you imagine that Christians do all of that? That's not just for lost people. Christians live like this as well. Sins of omission, not being baptized after salvation. There are people that come to faith in Christ and will not follow Jesus in full immersion believers' baptism. They just won't do it. And then they're not sharing the gospel. Did you know it's a sin to not share the gospel? We are commanded. And you cannot show up in front of Jesus one day and go, I had my reasons for not sharing the gospel. I didn't know the Bible well enough. Well, whose fault was that? Or I don't know what to say. It would be better to say it and say it wrong than to not say it at all. Share Jesus. Not keeping God first in your life. You know God said that there are to be no other gods before him. There can be all kinds of gods that we've got before God. Money. 
job, hobbies, pleasure, retirement, whatever it is. It might be not keeping our marriage vows. Divorce is a sin. I don't care what the reasons were. Divorce is a sin. It's a covenant. Not being faithful to our spouse. Not serving the Lord. Not teaching our children to serve. Did you know that God commands us to teach our children right from wrong? He calls, calls us, commands us to teach our children right from wrong and to teach them scripture and not tithing faithfully God even says in there to not tithe is to rob him and then not being hospitable we are to open our homes to other people and invite them in to a Christ centered home not honoring our father and mother there's a lot of people that are just angry at their parents and I am not going to honor them and they don't deserve honor and they want to wonder why God's not giving me a blessed life I mean why is my life always in problem it's one of the Ten Commandments. If you do not honor your mother and father, God will not bless you. You may leave here today and go, well, that's been the problem all this time. If you do not honor your mother and father, it has nothing to do with an earned respect. You honor your mother and father simply because God gave them to you. I don't care if they're drunkards. I don't care if they curse. I don't care if they're an atheist. I don't care if they're a wife beater. I don't care who they are. God says, honor your mother and father. And it's the only commandment of the Ten Commandments that comes with a promise that you may live long on the face of this earth. So it's not an earned respect. You honor them because they're your parents. Period. And if you don't have your relationship right with your parents today and they're still alive, call them. Take this Sunday afternoon. Go home and call your parents and ask their forgiveness. Not trusting the Lord. Not working hard. You know, you've heard, don't work hard, work smart. There is no substitute for hard work. The Bible tells us in Scripture that we are to work and to serve, not be slothful, and not living peacefully with others. There are some people that are just divisive. They're always starting something, always starting some drama. Well, that's not godly. And not taking care of the temple. What does that mean? Not taking care of the body. God said, you destroy the temple, I'll destroy you. This is God's property. God created you, he owns you. And so just to treat it like you want to by getting drunk or smoking or doing whatever you want to do with sexual immorality, whatever you're doing to your body, it's not just for your own pleasure. God says, I will deal with you if you are tearing down your body. So these are just a few of the ones that we could put up on just one screen, but that's the war. But we could take the flip side of this. Instead of lust, we could have love. Instead of greed, we could have generosity. Instead of angry, we could have peace. Instead of jealousy, we can bless. We could go all the way down through immorality. We could live pure. See, there's that two-sided war going on. If you are a Christian, you have two natures. Now, if you're not a Christian, you only have one nature. You have a sin nature. And God's common grace does allow some good to come from your life. But it's not to your reward in Jesus Christ. And so we really need to focus on watching this war play out. You're not just supposed to sit on the sidelines and let the war rage. Fight the good fight of faith until the box is closed on your casket. Fight the good fight of faith. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this story, but it's the story of a missionary that came to the United States, and he started making his way across America. And as he went across, it was unpopulated except for Indians. And he moved through, and he was a believer, and he was a missionary and sharing the gospel. Well, he made his way to a few tribes and would share the gospel, and he would share with this particular Indian brave or, or with this squaw. He would kind of go to different ones. But he finally realized, I need to start seeing the chief. If I'm going to get anywhere with these different tribes, I need to kind of speak to the chief so I, he will help me to speak to the whole group of people. Well, he went to this one tribe, and he was able to sit down with the chief, and he shared the gospel with the chief, and this went against their pagan rituals and what they had always believed in from their ancestors down. So anyway, he believes in Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, and is saved. So the chief becomes a Christian, and now he tells his whole tribe, this is who you need to believe in. This is our new God. Well, he wanted the missionary to stay and teach, and as missionaries often do, they're like, well, we'd love to stay and teach, and I will make some rounds through here, but I must share the gospel. My heart is to go to more tribes, share the gospel with more people, lead more Indian people and tribes to Jesus Christ. He said, but I'll come back and check on you, and I'll do some more teaching when I'm here, but I'll be back in a couple of months. The old Indian chief said, okay. So the missionary goes on. He finds some other tribes. He shares the gospel. Well, sure enough, true to his word, he came back through a couple of months later. 
And as he came back, he went in and sat down with the old chief in his tent. And he said, so chief, you've been a Christian now for about two months. And he said, what's being a Christian like? How has your Christian walk been going? He said, well, it'd be like this. It's like two dogs fighting. A white dog and a black dog. The missionary was kind of surprised. He never heard any kind of response like this from someone he shared the gospel with. So he didn't quite really know know what to say to the old Indian chief and he just said well which dog's winning he said whichever one I feed the most (laughs) the white dog of his righteousness or the black dog of his sin and whenever you've watched dogs fight the one that gets the upper hand is the one that's got the most strength at the moment then when this one gets weaker then this one gets stronger and then he starts being on top of the other dog and he's actually winning and then this one gains a little strength and that one's getting weak putting all the effort through which dog are you feeding Are you feeding your white dog more? Or are you feeding the black dog more? Because whichever one you feed the most, that is the one that's winning the most. Let's stand.